In this video, we're going to introduce the basic bivariate regression model that we'll be building on for the rest of the course. Initially, we're going to make some simplifying assumptions about the relationship that exists between a variable we're trying to explain and some other variable that we're using to explain it. Specifically, we're going to assume that there's a linear relationship between the dependent variable, the y variable, the thing we're trying to explain, and an independent variable, which we'll label x initially, which we're assuming is affecting the level of the dependent variable. We're going to assume that x is causing y, but y is not causing x. And we're going to write this in linear form as the level of y for each observation in our observed data is assumed to be equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x, where beta 0 is the intercept of that equation, and beta 1 is the slope. The intercept is where that equation crosses the vertical axis, and the slope is a measure of the change in the dependent variable that occurs when there's a one unit change in the independent variable, or x. So it's telling us how y changes when there's a one unit change in the level of x. Here's a graph of that relationship. We're assuming that beta 0, the intercept, is positive, and beta 1, the slope, is positive. When beta 1 is larger, the equation is steeper. When beta 1 is smaller, it becomes flatter. If beta 1 is negative, we'd have a downward sloping relationship. So a positive value of beta 1, or positive slope, indicates that there's a direct relationship between the variables x and y, which means they're moving in the same direction. When x goes up, y goes up. When x goes down, y goes down. If there was an inverse relationship and a negative slope, then an increase in x would be associated with a decrease in y, and we'd say that there was an inverse relationship between x and y. It would be really nice if all our data points fell exactly on this line. But when we gather data, it's not likely they're all going to fit some sort of linear relationship exactly. And that's why we introduce error terms into the equation. And that error term, which we're going to label u sub i, accounts for deviations between what we observe and what this linear relationship captures. So we can write the equation now with this error term as the observed y, y sub i, for each observation, is equal to beta 0, the intercept, plus beta 1, the slope times x, plus u sub i. So ui captures that part of the y that we observe that can't be explained by knowing the level of x. So the error term represents the unexplained component of y. In any model that we're going to work with, an error term is going to always be needed. And let's just talk briefly about some of the reasons why that occurs. One is that no matter how elaborate your model, there's always going to be some factors that you haven't included. So one reason for the existence of the error term is that it's capturing things that we either have not observed or, in some cases, things that we cannot observe. Also, people don't always behave in exactly the same way, that there's some degree of randomness in how people make their choices. Furthermore, when we gather data, some of the data may be measured incorrectly. When people fill out surveys, sometimes they answer questions that are not the questions on the paper. The equation that we fit may not reflect the actual functional relationship between the two variables. We might assume a linear model when the true model is quadratic or logarithmic or some other type of relationship. The equation we have here is called the population regression function, which indicates that we believe in our model that the level of y is a linear function of x plus this error term. So the level of y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x, which is the part that is explained by the regression, plus that random error component. And in this diagram, we can see that when the error terms are positive, the points fall above the line. For those points that fall below the line, the error terms are negative. So all the points that are above the line have positive error terms. All the points below it have negative error terms. If we want to estimate this relationship between y and x, the most common way of doing that is an ordinary least squares estimation procedure. And the way that works 
is we find estimates of beta 0 and beta 1 that minimize the sum of those squared error terms. And when we do that, we get estimates of beta 0 and beta 1 and of the error terms that we're representing here with a little hat over them or caret over them. And we use that to denote fitted values. And either variant of the equation on the screen is what we call a sample regression function, which is our estimated value of the parameters. We never directly observe the true values of beta 0 and beta 1, but instead we use an estimation procedure to get the values of the intercept and slope that best fits the data. And specifically, by best fit, we mean that the sum of those squared deviations, the sum of those squared distances from the points to the line is minimized. We get the smallest possible sum of squared error terms. Let's take an example to illustrate this. Suppose that we want to analyze the relationship between gun ownership and gun fatalities. And we collect data from US states. And we use these two variables. One is gun deaths, which is gun fatalities per 100,000 people in the state in the year 2016. Household guns is defined to be the proportion of households in state I that own one or more guns in 2016. And in this year, we have 50 observations on each of these variables. And this is the population regression function, the relationship that we assume occurs in the population. And UI represents the error term. However, again, we don't directly observe beta 0, beta 1, or u, and those are things we're going to be trying to estimate. We can plot all those points on an xy axis like this, and when we do it, we call that a scattergram. And the scattergram here indicates that there seems to be a general positive association between gun ownership and gun deaths. Any sort of line we fit here is likely to be in upward sloping relationship because we see there are quite a few states that have very low levels of gun ownership and not too many people being killed by firearms, while there are some where there's a lot of guns and quite a large proportion of people being killed by guns. When we find the estimated slope and intercept that minimizes the semi-squared error terms, we end up with an estimated equation that's given by gun deaths are equal to 2.84 plus 25.83 times the proportion of households that own guns. The most interesting term for our purposes here is that slope coefficient, the 25.83. What this is telling us is that if 1% more of the population owns guns in a given state, the number of deaths per 100,000 people would increase by 25.83. And similarly, a 10% increase in household gun ownership would result in 258.3 additional deaths per 100,000 people in the state. And we can add that estimated equation to our scattergram, and that shows you how that least squares regression has come up with a line that somehow best fits the observed data. We'll talk about all of these concepts in much more detail and very shortly we'll be adding in additional variables and we'll be talking about the assumptions of this model in more detail in later videos.